This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Of Tyrants and Tea Kettles by Leslie Heron. Chapter 8, Croton. How can you be this picky about your coat, Gramps? Piper shifted Vel's weight against her shoulders so she could give him a look. She helped him limp down another back alley, leading to a different cobblestone road. My feet are getting sore. Sorry, my bullet wound is causing you harm, Vel grunted, struggling to keep up with her pace. Piper chuckled a little. <laughs> I didn't mean nothing like that. It's just that we've been to five different stores, and you ain't found a coat yet. She stopped, poking her head out into the street and squinting against the setting sun. She cursed under her breath and pulled him back into the shadow of the alleyway, pressing him flat against the wall. Vel looked down at her hand on his chest, then back to her. He was about to question her when he heard the commotion of marching boots on the street. Military soldiers, all clad in blood-red coats. They were patrolling the roads in groups of three to four. Vel and Piper weren't sure if they were the target of these patrols, but they had agreed not to find out. We can't keep docking these soldiers. Piper peered around the edge of the alley again, looking up and down the street before helping Vel back into the bustle of people. Vel's plan to help those homeless had been great and all, but she worried it had backfired on them. The soldiers were on high alert now, shouting orders at each other and calling on one another to double back and retrace their steps. Vel was surprised just how many back alleys this town had. Piper pushed him down another one, just as the sound of marching boots picked up. I'm not trying to be difficult, but the last door was selling literal rags. Vel leaned against the wall, giving Piper a break from his weight. If we're going to be running around this city, I need to look the part so we don't get tossed out. Piper put her hands on her hips, nodding slightly. Fair enough, but I hate to tell you, I only know of one more shop, and then we run out of options. All right, I'll find something that works. He wouldn't say it aloud, but the truth was, Vel was quite accustomed to this military coat. It was snug and comfortable, yet it didn't cling to his mechanical arm. And unfortunately, all the shops they had visited so far didn't sell anything in red. Okay, so maybe he was being a little picky. Piper stretched out her back, delighting in the way her spine realigned with a snap. Ugh, I still say you just take it off for the time being. It's like walking around with a giant bullseye on your back, screaming, Catch me! Mel shook his head. Trust me, it would be worse if I went without. Nobody's gonna care if you're pasty or summit. Mel simply glared at her until she relented. Fine. Now that that's settled, let's get going. She moved to sidle back under Vel's arm when he pulled away. What's wrong? I was just joking with ya. It's not that. I just saw something. He reached down and plucked up a discarded length of thick, faded copper tubing. Vel leaned against it like a walking stick, testing his weight and was surprised to see that it hadn't buckled under his denser-than-average body. I'll just use this. That way we can be more inconspicuous. Piper nodded again. Not bad. She turned to peer around the wall, glancing up and down the street before waving her companion to follow. They stepped out into the busy throngs of people and were whisked away by the crowd. The trip to the final shop took longer than Piper would have liked. Every few blocks they were forced to hide from patrols, skirt around curious onlookers, or simply stop to let Vel recover. Once, they even had to make a detour around three square city blocks due to a military standoff with the locals. 
Piper put her hands on her knees, taking in deep breaths as if she had just run a mile. They better have the mother of all coats at this place. She straightened up, taking in a lungful of air. Okay, come on, Gramps. It's not much farther. Vel followed her down the back alley until she stepped out the other side into what felt like a completely separate section of the city. It was cloaked in the shadow of the floating metropolis. The tall spires anchoring it to the ground cast long shadows that bathed the surrounding area with a gloom. The community had responded to the perpetual shadow with various neon lights, strings of lit paper lanterns, and crackling gas lamps. There were street carts selling the most delectable smelling foods, vendors trying to entice shoppers into buying bolts of silk or strings of unusual gems, and even a line of scantily clad women offering their services for a fee. Vel had to sidestep one woman as she tried to toss a length of silk around his neck to pull him in closer. While she was definitely female-ish, the people in this part of town were far from human. Heck, they weren't even mammals. The local populace seemed to be descended from reptiles. They stood at about chest height, with varied hues of scaly skin and spines, and beautiful, shifting metallic patterns. But their faces reminded him of dragons. They had long snouts, tiny eyes with vertical slit pupils, and clawed hands. Vo was used to seeing the unusual, especially when it came to different races, but this was something new. <clears throat> You're afraid to go let off some steam, if you want. Piper was suddenly standing beside him, staring up at him with a grin that spread from ear to ear. Vel's face went beet red. She had caught him staring at one of the ladies of the night. No, I'm good. He motioned with his free hand for her to continue on. They were interesting, but not in that way. Piper turned with a shrug and stepped through a milling throng of people. Vel followed behind at a limping pace, noticing that the folk here didn't seem to mind his military jacket. Rather than recoil, they approached him specifically with syrupy levels of respect. He decided the local authorities must spend a fair amount of cash in this district. As they walked, Vel took in his surroundings as best he could, his head swiveling back and forth until he developed a crick in his neck. They passed butcher shops and acupuncture clinics, a general store, a shop that sold nothing but ornate masks, and even another bordello. Groups of dragon people were huddled around small tables, betting on games played with tiles. As they passed a merchant selling exotic creatures that looked like winged frogs, they stopped at a large red door. The neon sign above the shop was written in an elegant foreign script with a picture of a two-headed snake and a series of symbols that even Vel's AI was having trouble translating. The building itself looked as if it had been a last-minute addition, forced between two imposing apothecary shops. The smell wafting from the buildings was enough to make his eyes water. Bracing in it! Piper smiled uncomfortably, willing herself to keep her bile down. She pushed against the red door and stepped inside. Vel trailed in behind her, noting that the smell seemed to permeate the concrete walls. The inside of the shop was no bigger than it had appeared, and almost every inch of space was filled with clothing racks, piles of folded fabric, and bins containing a large assortment of what appeared to be primarily left shoes. Large hooks hung from the wall every foot or so, holding handbags, shirts, and coats alike. Vel staggered to a stop. He hadn't seen this much stuff crammed into a tiny space in years. 
Not since visiting a particular soothsaying shop back home belonging to Evan's grandmother. A single ceiling fan spun lazily above, swirling the scents of the adjoining apothecaries like a pungent whirlwind. Piper made her way through the maze of clothing, toward a faded lamp that guided them to the counter, and tapped on a small bell. It echoed throughout the empty shop. What are you doing? Vel hissed, leaning against his staff for support. Relax, I know the proprietor. We have to bargain with her, and we ain't got any money other than a few pearls. The only thing we have to bother with is the coat, Piper began. She was interrupted by the sound of scurrying feet and the sudden appearance of the shop owner. Vel's mouth fell ajar. The woman that was climbing the stool behind the counter was almost exactly the reptilian twin of Evan's grandmother. She was small, incredibly small, even for one of these dragon people, with thick black eyebrows and a tight bun of dark hair. She grinned up at him, and he could see that she had three or four golden teeth in a maw of pointy fangs. She was so squat that when she smiled, she looked more like a toad than a dragon. What can I do for you? The proprietor asked in a thick, raspy accent, her grin never fading as she stared hungrily up at Vel. We're in the market for a new coat. Piper waved at her companion, tugging on the collar of his military jacket a little. Vel couldn't find the words. His mouth opened and closed, like a fish struggling to breathe out of water. The shop owner seemed to notice Piper for the first time. Her smile fell noticeably. Oh, you. She shrugged and leaned one elbow onto her counter. We have many fine coats. Is there something in particular you are looking for? She asked, running two stubby fingers along her chin. Piper leaned one arm against the counter as well, moving in closer to the little old woman. The truth is, Granny, that we're out of cash and need a coat that you'd be willing to trade for that one. She jerked her thumb at her shoulder, motioning to her companion. How many times must I tell you, girl? Don't call me Granny. Piper cut her off. I know, I know. Look, can you help us out or not? The old woman narrowed her eyes at the girl. How did you come by this coat? Piper chewed her lip for a moment, trying to find the right words. We, uh, didn't kill anybody, if that's what you're asking. Vel cleared his throat before adding, Ma'am. The proprietor laughed. It was a deep, rumbling laugh for someone so small. She hopped down from her stool and scuttled over to him, leaning against her own tiny walking stick. She reached up and tugged on the coat hauling Vel painfully down to one knee. She flipped it out and ran the hem through her fingers. She nodded and turned to Piper. No. Piper gestured to Vel. It's in perfect condition. It's a filthy. You can wash it. It's a military specialty item. If it's specialty, you can charge extra. The old woman gave her a calculating stare. Piper stared back, unwilling to budge. Vel knelt there, extremely uncomfortable, screaming internally at the shooting pains in his legs. The shopkeep huffed. Very well, we can do business, but only because your friend here is so charming. She slapped Vel on the shin with her stick and gave him a lecherous smile before returning to her stool. Anything off the wall is fine. Piper turned to Vel with another ear-to-ear -ear smile on her face. There you have it, Grandad. Take your pick, and let's get going. Vel hauled himself to his feet, hesitantly looking around. The shop was barely large enough to accommodate the amount of clothes this old woman had forced into it, let alone customers. This meant he would have to change in front of the two of them. He wasn't normally shy about this sort of thing, 
but the way they were tittering to one another certainly made him wish he had listened closer to his brother. After browsing for a few minutes, he reached out and grabbed a coat that loosely resembled a duster. It was brown leather, with far more buckles and buttons than was technically necessary. But there were plenty of pockets, both inside and out. As a realm traveler, one must learn to move light, and an ample number of pockets becomes a necessity. He slid the red coat off his shoulders. Behind him, there was a shocked intake of breath. You weren't lying, were ya? Piper's voice was somewhere between awed and horrified as she saw the expanse of metal plates replacing large swaths of his torso. You'd stand out in a crowd for sure. She reached out and ran her fingers over a large metal section on his side. How did you survive this? Vel jumped back, snatching a linen shirt from a nearby table and shoving it over his head. He glanced at the old woman, who just grinned back at him but didn't protest. He tossed the military jacket in the direction of Piper while avoiding her gaze. Take all my stuff out of the pockets before you give her the coat. He slid his arms into the leather duster and made to do up the clasps. Piper could take a hint and said no more about the augments. She began digging through the pockets, tossing everything into a pile on the counter. As she reached into one pocket, she pulled out the handful of pearls she had purloined in Silverport. The old woman gave her a withering look. No cash. Piper shrugged innocently and slid a single pearl across the table. For the shirt. Vel let out a cry of frustration. Oh, why does this thing have so many damn buckles and buttons? Who needs this many fasteners on a coat? He fidgeted with the sleeves, tugging against them in anger in an attempt to cover his wrists. Piper laughed as she counted the handful of pearls into her own pocket. It's all the rage around here, Gramps. You should say the outfits them rich folks wear up in the aerial district. If it ain't got a hundred snaps on it, it's no good. She turned toward him, helping him with the harder-to-manage clasps. Not too shabby. Now I'll leave you to sort all that clutter back into your pockets. I think I might be able to wrangle us up something to eat. She patted her pocket that contained the pearls. Vel shifted his shoulders uncomfortably against the inside of the coat. Not that that doesn't sound like a great idea. His stomach gave an audible rumble. But, uh, don't you think we should find your friend? Yeah, I know, but you've lost a lot of blood, and you're looking a tad peaky. I think maybe some food will do you good first. Piper turned and began making her way out of the shop, leaving him alone with the old woman. We don't... He paused to find the right words to argue his case for leaving, but she was already out the door. He looked over at the counter to see the old woman licking her lips as she looked him up and down. He gave a nervous chuckle, then crammed all his possessions into his new coat, taking care to secure the remains of the portal locker in an inside pocket. He gave the shopkeep a curt nod, Ma'am, and spun on his heel, hobbling after Piper as fast as his copper walking stick would allow. Behind him, he could hear a low, lecherous cackle, followed by, Come again. They'll burst into the street, instantly swallowed by the crowd. He looked back and forth, trying to find Piper. Nothing. He hobbled over to the nearest food stand and asked if they had seen a dark-skinned girl. They hadn't. After inquiring at several more establishments, he began to get a sinking feeling in his gut. Just as he was convinced she had ditched him, a large, skewered portion of questionably seasoned meat was thrust beneath his nose. Yeah, this should put a bit of pep back in ya. Vel took the meat from Piper, more relieved to see her than he would like to admit. What is it? Piper shrugged as she tore off a sizable chunk with her teeth. 
I dare ask. She chewed on the stringy meat, forcing it down with a heavy swallow. Ah, come on, we can walk as you eat. Are we headed up to this aerial district? Vel sniffed the meat a few times before sinking his teeth in. Whatever it was, it was delicious. The seasonings were both pleasantly sweet and blisteringly spicy at the same time, causing beads of sweat to break out across his forehead. The meat itself was a bit too gamey for his tastes, but the spices covered it well enough. Nah, my associate shall be living in me old house. I ain't exactly upper-class material, in case you hadn't noticed. Vil continued to work his way through the meat as he followed her through the streets. She was right. As he ate, he began to feel more like himself. Perhaps it was the peppery spice, jump-starting his adrenaline again. Or the fact that his mouth was on fire, and that distracted him from the pain in his thigh. Piper paused looking up and down the street before stepping out of the shadows. The alley connected the main thoroughfare to what the folks were calling the No Guard District. They traded the enchanting glow of red neon lights for the flickering radiance of electric lanterns. A few of us banded together to get a place outside the slums. It's tiny, but we don't have to worry about the street sweepers up this far. The sun had finally disappeared beyond the horizon, and the main city was sparking to life. They had left behind the dregs of lower class and stepped out onto the rich, paved streets of the middle class. Crudely fashioned robots were cleaning the sidewalks. Steam-powered automobiles trundled down the street noisily, and military guards were replaced by police dressed in uniforms of rich burgundy. Piper turned around to see the look of awe on Vel's face. It was rather comical, given the amount that he was sweating. She smiled and tugged against his new coat sleeve. There will be plenty of time later to stand around and gawk at everything. My old home is right down this street. Vel peered down the darkening road in the direction she was pointing. There were fewer vehicles and people on this street. Something felt off about it. Even for middle class, it seemed a little dirtier, the houses less maintained and considerably smaller. Even the few vehicles he saw were mostly stationary, left in varying states of disrepair. Vel held his tongue as he limped along behind her. One of the mechanical robots was dumping a bin of rubbish when something caught his eye. Ruffling gently on top of the pile was a faded newspaper. He reached over and snatched it off the heap. It was stained and water-damaged, but it looked fairly recent. Unfolding it, he read the headline, High Inquisitor to Increase Gentrification Spending in Effort to Combat Food Shortage. That sounded, well, not good. He narrowed his eyes at the picture that took up the rest of the page. It looked as if it was taken during a press conference or a meeting of some sorts. Three men were standing in the middle of a well-lit room. One man, standing off to the left, was wearing the sharpest business suit Vel had ever seen. But the hat brim pulled low over his face told him that man wasn't the Inquisitor and neither was the other suit standing opposite him. The man standing front and center of the picture must be the High Inquisitor, Vel thought. He folded the newspaper in half and brought it closer to his face. Even though the picture was water-damaged, he could still make out the finer embroidered details on the Inquisitor's stark white robes, but his face was hidden beneath a fabric hood that had been designed to look like the face of an owl. Vel's eyes went back to the headline, Food Shortage. Piper had mentioned the decimation of the surrounding farmland, but he had simply assumed they were shipping in food from farther away. Apparently, it was not enough. He looked up to ask Piper about the hooded figure. She was nowhere in sight. He glanced around, noticing the road curved around a bend. 
he followed the humming of the lights until he reached the end of the street. There were no houses here, only a single Do Not Enter sign and a flimsy attempt to rope off the street. Where buildings would have been, there was only rubble. Broken bricks and splintered slabs of concrete were tangled in a mess of twisted copper wiring and shattered glass. Everything was blackened, charred by the flames of an intense fire. Piper stood in front of the smallest rubble pile, her hands clutching at her arms as if she were cold. Piper? Vel moved next to her, putting a gentle hand on her shoulder. This was my home. She pulled her gaze away to look up at him, her eyes sparkling with tears. She watched him for a moment before turning back to stare at the rubble. Vel frowned, looking over the remains. Whatever had happened here, this was where it had started. His AI began running simulations and statistics for survivability. The numbers weren't great. You never know. Your friend might have made it out. Vel squeezed her shoulder a little, as if to reassure her. Were you close? She turned to face him again, tears now streaming down her cheeks. He's my brother. Of Tyrants and Tea Kettles is book two of the ongoing Psy Fantasy series by author Leslie Heron. Join us as the adventure unfolds, with new chapters releasing every few weeks. I'm telling ya, this place will have just what you're looking for. Welcome, welcome to Crazy Charlie's Rags to Robes Clothing Boutique. If we don't have it, you probably didn't want it anyway. How may I be of service? Ah, uh, look at this place. Why are we even here? Give him a chance. He might have the perfect jacket. Oh, nope. Sorry. All out of jackets at the moment. I have a lovely washcloth here, though, if you're interested. No jackets? How about a nice sweater? No, no. How about a slightly used hanky? A shirt? Ooh, fresh out. Let's see. A, a nice cloak might work. No. I've got an old tablecloth you could wear as a cloak. So, what you're saying is you're legitimately crazy, and all you carry is rags to slightly larger rags. Well, mostly. But... I do have some rather nice doilies. Just out of curiosity, how nice is that tablecloth you mentioned? <laughs>